hear me? I can. Okay. All right. So my name's Allison, and I'm gonna kind of give you an overview of my journey that I've had with this weight loss surgery. Um, I have nothing bad to say this far, and as of last week or July thirtieth, I was two years out. Um, when I weighed last week, I had lost one hundred and two point nine pounds. Um, so a little bit about the beginning of my story. Uh, for one, I'd always kind of had weight troubles during childhood up through adulthood. Well, two years ago, I decided I wanted to check more into having bariatric surgery because I kept hearing more about people having it. Some people I'd known had had it and had good results, um, which I was kind of skeptical to because I would always always heard people like, no, don't do that, don't do that, you know, or people may be like, oh, it's the easy way out. Well, let me tell you, it's by far not the easiest way out. Um, so I had got to the point where I was like, okay, I'm going to set me up an appointment, you know, go through the process to get um, a visit. And so I, I did. And so I went through six months of just, you know, your average test that you go through. Um, and then July 30th of 19, I went in to have my surgery. Um, for me, I weighed 224.2 the week before I had my surgery. And then, like I said, as of last week, I had lost down to 102, or I lost 102.9 pounds. Uh, I did have a little trouble. Uh, after I had my surgery, I, I just could not get in my protein or my liquid in which strictly it was just my fault because I was not sip, 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 like they tell you to do. Everything that they tell you to do, you do. There is a reason for it. They have planned this whole bariatric guide. I still have my guide and it will always be with me Um, because I, I mean, that way I can always have it to look back at if I have a question about something, but um, like I said, I struggled with getting in my fluids and my proteins. I guess it was about a month after I had to go two days in a row for fluids, um, in which I eventually figured out, okay, just do like they say, every 15 minutes, drink your two ounces. I believe that's what they say. Um, so I started doing that. As far as my liquid, or my protein, I use Gym Pro. I found it to be the best for me. It did take me a while to be able to drink it uh, with something that I actually like. Um, I found that actual, let's see, it's Minute Maid Dot Lemonade is what I actually mix my Gym Pro in. That way I could get my protein because nothing else just tastes right to me. I don't know. I guess it was just, I don't know. I just could, it just didn't taste right unless it was with that, but I started getting that in. Um, so, like I said, when, after your surgery, you're going to really follow their, I mean, their stages they have for you because each stage is how you're, it's what you need to do. Do what they tell you to do because that's what's going to lead you to success. And I have also found out that a major, major thing that I believe that has helped me is I log everything I eat and everything you drink because I believe you being able to actually see what you're putting in your body as you know your food your liquid helps you keep up to make sure you're getting your protein make sure you're getting your liquid and you can also say okay that's got a lot of calories or okay that's got a lot of carbs um I actually you know there's several different apps you can use but like I said if when you have your weight loss surgery if you're considering it just log your food because our I'm 100% believer in that. Um, I do have, I have a picture that I'll show you guys. It was my bariatric picture that they took at the clinic. I hope you can see it. I couldn't get it printed out. Um, so here's, maybe you can kind of see, let me get it up there. There's my before and after picture, which you can kind of see that's, that's a pretty big difference. That's like almost a, a whole person. Um, I just, I am so thankful I did it, honestly. And they, and 
to the truth. I wish I had done it sooner and I wish I would not have waited, but everything I went through, every struggle, pre-surgery, uh, post-surgery, it was 100% worth it. I know I've had, like, I'll have people stop and ask me questions and I'm just like, you know, it's, it's worth it. I'm just like, don't think about it, just do it. I mean, there, there's nothing holding you back. I have so much more confidence now. I feel so much better. And literally when people say you, you can, you know, say somebody run upstairs or yes, you can run upstairs. You can keep up with your kids. It, it, you just would not believe how much better you feel. I did not have a lot of health issues, but I do have a lot of health issues in my family, such as diabetes and things like that. So I wanted to go ahead and kind of get a head start on that because that is something that I did not want. Um, but like I was just, I was ready to do something so that I could feel confident and be happy and, you know, live a healthy life. Because I, I truly, I want to be there for my daughter for one. Um, and then also, you know, can't leave out the husband. Um, so I don't know if anybody really has any questions or if there's anything else that Ms. Vivian might want me to say or if you have questions for her. Um, you can just you feel free to ask. All right, if you have questions, you can go ahead and type them in the chat box. Um, well, we have some congratulations for you, Ms. Allison. Thank you, thank you. So if you have any questions for Allison or for me, just let me know. Okay, so one of the questions is, was there anything you loved before surgery that suddenly made you sick, sick afterwards? Or rather something that never bothered um, you previously? Well, I do know after I had my surgery, I could not eat eggs. And I know that was a big, you know, thing, way to get your protein in. But the first time made me sick. Second time I was, you know, scared to try a little while later. And then I did it again. And finally, now I can eat eggs. No problem. I just, I can pretty much feel like I can eat anything. I just stay away from bread. Can't eat a steak because I feel like it really sits hard on my stomach. But just definitely stay away from your bread and your carbs um and as far as your protein there are lots of things out there that you can get you know your protein in that doesn't have a lot of carbs like they'll tell you eat your p3s or i'll eat balanced black breaks um there's protein crunch bars i literally every for morning breakfast i would eat the oikos triple zero yogurt um it was wonderful I loved it and I'll still eat it every once in a while. Cheese, nuts, um, eat your grilled chicken and your fit grilled fish. Like I said, just be sure to eat your protein first, like they say, because I feel like when I eat my protein first, I'm not gonna want anything else. And that's your main thing is getting in your protein. And like I said, you know, if there's something that they say you can have, if it doesn't work for you the first time, I say that doesn't mean that you're not gonna be able to eat it later on, because obviously for me, eggs was a big problem and i was able to still eat those and i still eat those now so that's i don't i wouldn't even think of that as an issue all right and then we have another question um well rich they just wanted to know as far as recovery phase which of course recovery that's very dependent on the person but just for the mo the biggest part of it if you have a job and it's a desk job then you pretty much can go back to work in a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks, if you're allowed to be able to get your protein and your fluids in. But if you have a job that requires heavy lifting, anything greater than 10 pounds, you would have to be off for six weeks. So was your recovery right. phase okay, Ms. Allison? Yes, I, I would have been able to go back in two weeks because I kind of had a desk job, but because I could not get my protein in or my liquids, I was three weeks, which, I mean, for one, if you're not getting your fluids and proteins in, you're not even going to feel like going back to work. So like they tell you, I mean, I know they stress that. They they mean that for a reason because you're just like, I just felt so tired and weak. But that's just part of the process. Don't let that discourage you. I say after a good three months, I started feeling so much better. I was able to get my proteins and my liquids. I mean, you know, don't be scared. Don't let anything like that 
like discourage you from this because that could just be i mean that may just be a little bump in the road that's it's still completely worth it and you're like i said you're going to need all that time to really recover too as far as like mentally and then your body just healing i mean it's it's a big change but it's a good change Okay, and I want to know if you had any side effects from the surgery like hair loss. Yes, I did have hair loss, um, but that's why they tell you to take your vitamin, um, but just take all your vitamins that they instruct you to take. It's part of it, but now my hair, it has pretty much grown back. I mean, that's just a little bump in the road, like I said. Anything else, don't let that discourage you. Just do it and go on and just take your vitamins like you're supposed to. Okay, and of course hair is protein. So of course you need to make sure you're getting your protein in. That helps a lot with it too. But if you're deficient in your protein and you're not staying up with that protein on a regular basis, if you would say that two out of the seven days, you you know, you don't get your protein in or you get really close, then that may be okay. But if five out of the seven days, you're barely getting your protein in, and that's a big deal. So you do want to try to focus on your protein. They have the ready-made shakes. They have the powder. They have a lot of different things. And one of the patients um, recently had a problem with protein and tolerating it as far as the taste. Uh, she found some at GNC, but it was in West Memphis. It was a GNC store, but some of those stores are like franchise, and some of them are independent. So she was able to find way good, W-H-E-Y, and it's a, looks like a fudge popsicle, but they have all different kinds of the popsicles, and it's 21 grams of protein, and it's very low in carbs. So that helped her to be able to get through the point to where she could, you know, do protein and not have difficulty with it. So, and then another patient um, wanted to know about diabetes, CPAP, and all of that. Well. First of all, if you're on a CPAP machine, you need to make sure you bring it to the hospital with you. You need to make sure you're wearing it because sleep apnea means you have periods to where you stop breathing, which means there's not oxygen going to the brain and you're gonna impede blood supply. So you don't wanna do that, number one, because you have a large area that you're trying to heal. Number two, you wanna make sure that you're not reducing that blood flow to the brain. So you want to use your CPAP device. Some people come off of their CPAP device. We have patients who are at Gold BMI still on their CPAP device simply because of the fact of heart function. It helps with their heart function. So it's a lot of different reasons why people have a CPAP device and why they're still using it. So it's not necessary that you gain or you lose 50 pounds and you'll be off your CPAP machine, but I would advise you to follow up with pulmonary so that way you will have the opportunity to be taken down or potentially taken off of the CPAP machine if that's um, what your weight loss warrants. All right, so um, they want to know if you were actually working a job at all during this time period. And yes, I was. Okay. I worked a 40 hour a week job. I actually worked at um, a bank. So uh, I got to move a, a lot, but then I got to see it. So, I mean, it, it worked out for me. I don't know, you know, how it would be for someone that would be up all the time, but I figure the more you move around, the better you'll probably feel per se. Yes, and it's a lot of things that you can do as far as your hair loss. You will have some hair loss just simply because of the fact that the stress of the surgery. So regardless of what surgery you're having, you could be having a knee replacement. But anytime you go under anesthesia, that's a stress to your body. So you'll have some hair loss, but you never think about it because the new follicles are already coming back in. But if you're deficient on your protein, and you're consistent with being deficient on your protein, then that's when you start noticing the hair loss because those new follicles are not starting to come back in. So that's why you need to make sure that you're up on your protein. Of course, you can take your biotin. Uh, you can also um, avoid chemicals, a lot of chemicals in your hair, like a lot of permanent colors, things like that, because that break down the strands and it also causes it to break more so you don't want to do that i would say for the first six months do not put any permanent colors now you can use a semi-permanent 
but I wouldn't put any permanent colors on there or a lot of chemicals on your hair because that really breaks it down and it makes it really weak. So I wouldn't do that if you're concerned about hair loss. Um, also, with um, after the surgery, as far as your fluids and your protein, if you have a job, in which some people I understand, especially if they work in the medical field and they may work in the lab, it's really restricted as far as having fluids when you're in the lab, if you're a worker who does things like that in the lab. So you would need to make sure that when you're not in the lab that you set goals to try to get started early, like before leaving home, maybe you'll go ahead and get in 10 to 15 ounces of fluid. And then when you get to work, maybe you'll have a goal to get 10 ounces in. And then on your break, you'll get, you need to section it out so where you know that you can still stay hydrated eat because you know you can't bring the liquids into the lab with you or wherever it is that you work where you're restricted from a fluid standpoint. Um, let me see. If you take medication, can this type of surgery help you get off your medication? It can help you get off your medication, but it just really depends on how long you've been on that specific medication. Like for diabetes, if you've been a diabetic for 20 years and you take, you're take you taking oral and injectables, well, it's a possibility that you want you will not come off all the oral but it's a good possibility that you'll come off of the injectables and maybe be reduced to just one oil, or you could come off all of it. But the longer you've had a disease process, then you have to think about that it'll be longer before you can actually come off of some of those meds. It'll have to be titrated slowly and not something you just instantly come off. Some of the oral diabetic medications, you will leave the hospital without those because it's hard to control your blood sugar if you take something orally. So you'll be given an injectable and a sliding scale to go by on that. But it's very individualized per patient. So it's kind of hard to say who will and who won't. It just depends on how your blood sugars are running after surgery. All right, and they want to know, did you experience a lot of uh, where you would hit your, your plateaus with your weight loss? Or did you kind of lose at a consistent rate? Um. I believe that I've kind of lost at a consistent rate, but I figure that depends on the person. You know, if you are getting in your proteins and your fluids, or you know, if you are eating right or vice versa. But for me, I, you know, you may slack off like a week, maybe not lose as much that week, or may not lose any that week. But I, I fairly lost at a slow rate, you know, gradually. I mean, it's not going to fall off all at one time, and I don't think you want it to do that too. Um, but back to the hair loss thing, I just thought that I did not do anything till I was over a year. I did not color my hair or anything because I was also worried about that. So I at least waited a year myself. But um, as far as your weight, I mean, for me, it come off, you know, fairly slowly. I don't, I don't remember any plateaus. All right, and then as far as um. They have a question about teaching you how to eat, which we give you that book for you to review and it helps you to know what to eat, how to eat it as far as stages, but you're the only one that can control from a standpoint of the types of food you eat. Now, as far as behavior modification, you know, we do include that because we try to teach you how to eat and things not to eat. Cognitive behavior therapy, um, that's something different. Um, I would say that does teach you how to eat and how to avoid those triggers. If you're an emotional eater or you you tend to eat when you are bored, things like that. So you need to first try to figure out why you're doing that. And if it's because you're bored, then you need to try to figure something out that you can do so that way you don't get into that phase of wanting to snack. Some people crave more carbs in the evening. Some people struggle with carbs on the weekend. So you just need to replace that with something healthy. All right. And then as far as medication, um, your medication cannot be swallowed whole after the surgery. It'll be three months before you're able to swallow pills whole. So the medications that we give you, if it's a capsule, it can either be open some of them are tablets and they can be crushed. And some of them may have to be changed to a totally different medication because you're not allowed to crush the current medication that you're on. 
but we will assess all of that when you get ready for surgery. We'll change all of that up and you'll be taking the actual medication that you will need to go home with while you're in the hospital. And just depending, some patients actually have their medication changed a few weeks before surgery just so they can get it into their system. It just kind of depends on the type of medication. And that's also individualized. And as far as issues with loose skin, um, as far as plastic surgery, it is your decision if you want to have plastic surgery. But as far as loose skin, that just really depends on the patient also. Because if you're losing weight, then you also want to be exercising. You want to be building muscle. Because if you're losing weight and you're not exercising, then you're losing muscle mass. So you don't want to lose muscle mass. You want to build muscle mass. That's why it's important that after the six weeks and you're released to full duty to where you can do strength training and cardio, you want to try to get involved with both of those types of exercises to help shrink some of that loose skin. And then, of course, if you decide to have weight loss surgery, I mean, not weight loss surgery, but plastic surgery, then you can do that after 18 months. The surgeons recommend about 18 months, and I want to say the plastic surgeons recommend about 18 months and that you be at least a good 10 to 15 pounds to your goal weight. Now, goal BMI for us is anything 25 and below, but you do not have to necessarily get to that goal weight. It's whatever goal you set for yourself. We're not going to set a goal for you because we want you to be happy with that goal. And if you set a goal for yourself, then you're the de making the decision of how you feel about your body. So we don't want to tell you, you need to be at this BMI. We just want you to do what you're supposed to do. And as things gradually happen and you're satisfied with it, then we're satisfied with it. All right, and what about exercising after the surgery? Walking for the first six weeks. Nothing that you're gonna be using a lot of abdominal muscle. So walking pretty much is it. You can do treadmill, you can do elliptical as long as you don't do the one that has the arms where you're using a lot of abdominal muscles, but you can use a stationary bike, things like that. But after the six weeks, then you're released to full duty and you can start doing whatever it is that you wanna do from strength training to cardio. All right, Ms. Allison, I think they have one for you. It said, did you notice that um, when you tried not to eat as many carbs at all, your weight loss stalled? Um, I actually asked this last week. I made the comment to Vivian, actually. I was like, why sometimes does it feel like if I eat more or maybe just be a little more carbs do I feel like I lose more? And she, Vivian, you can tell them what you okay. told me about that. All right. And it's really like she's logging everything that she's doing. She's logging her protein, her carbs, her sugars, all of it. So that would be the first thing I would recommend you to do. So when you hit a stall, if you continue to do what you're doing, you will fall out of that stall eventually. Your body has a protective mechanism. It's not going to let you go into muscle wasting. So that's why you will see in the very beginning, you'll see this huge drop. You'll come back in two weeks and you've probably lost anywhere from, I would say on an average with male and female, about anywhere from 12 to 25 pounds. And then you'll come back a month later and you've lost probably another 15 pounds. So when you come back and you hit that three month part, um, point, you're still losing pretty fast. Well, when you come back for that six month, you start noticing, well, it's slowing up. Well, it's intended to be that way because you're still going to lose. It's just that if you lost at that rate consistently, you would go into muscle wasting. So your body just protects itself and that's what it's supposed to do. Now, as far as adding, sometimes if you're doing a really low carb diet, and then I'm sure other people have noticed, and then you end up uh, picking, doing more of a moderate carb, you add some carbs to it, well, then you'll see that you lose a little weight, but that's just a short period. So that means you don't need to do that all the time. And it's just because you just confused your body for a few minutes. So don't think that you can do that and still lose weight if it continues. You still need to monitor what you're eating. If you're doing a low carb, that's fine. But you do not want to go to a high carb diet and you're doing, it's a difference in the good carbs and the bad carbs. 
So if you're going to add some carbs, it needs to be your good carbs, not your simple carbs, which are like your potatoes, your rice, your chips, your cookies, your things like that. You do not want to add that. You want complex carbs that are really good for you if you're going to add more carbs. So it's a difference because a lot of people say carbs, but they really don't differentiate between good or bad. So simple carbs are bad. Complex, complex carbs are good. Okay. All right. Yes. And stay away. I don't eat a lot of potatoes or things or rice either. I just, and like I said, if you eat your protein first, you're pretty much going to feel full enough that you're not even going to want the other stuff. And that's, that's true. And the thing is, mentally, you just have to, the mental hunger is going to always be there. So mentally, you want to do what you usually do before that you did before you had surgery. You want to go to, if you had a steak and you had a potato, you had some broccoli, you want to automatically go to that potato probably. I know that's where my mind would probably take me first. But you need to try to focus in on that protein because if you actually follow the rule, you would get full before you even made it to broccoli or anything. You're full. So, but if you try to drink with that, then you're only making it worse because number one, it's not enough room for steak and fluid. Number two, if you're drinking, you're prematurely pushing that down and you're getting full off of the liquids and not the protein. So 45 minutes later, you're ready to eat something again. And that's how some people end up getting into that snacking phase. You don't want to start snacking when you've had a meal and then 45 minutes later, you're back snacking. But if you focus in on that protein, that'll help prevent a lot of that wanting to snack, that desire to snack especially with carbs and they want okay. to know allison if you had any problems after surgery other than the difficulty with your fluids and protein no the, and you know just your tiredness but that all you know eventually goes away once you're getting your fluid and your liquids in or your fluid and your protein in, you you start feeling better i mean that was pretty much what i struggled with okay and also i want to say something about you know talking about the protein what I would do a lot too is I would just put the meat on my plate, but you know, a certain ounce of meat on my plate. Don't even put any of the other on your plate. That way it doesn't, you know, to kind of give you more control. That way you're not looking at all this other stuff. Just put the meat. That's all I would do for the longest. I would just put the meat on my plate. And still to this day, I do not, I wait 30 minutes after I eat before I drink anything. I mean, uh, like I said, if you follow their plan, it is going to work and may work everything you know that you're scared of that you may go through i mean it's it's a hundred percent worth it all right and they want to know about the gas allison so i guess they're talking about the trap gas right after surgery yeah it it does hurt but it goes away it they'll you know they give you i believe y'all gave us what gas x i think tablets mm -hmm. is what you give yeah. and also they tell you walk do not lay in that bed you get up you walk mark your little mark by your name stop by get you a pop fizzle that way you're getting some fluids and just walk 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 as much as you can because the more you're walking i think the more that helps move the gas so definitely i i think i lived on sugar free popsicles the whole time <laughs> so, <laughs> oh uh definitely just walk and it, it'll It'll just hurt, you know, it'll just be uncomfortable. It's nothing you can't handle. It'll just be uncomfortable. But like I said, if you walk, it'll, it'll pass. Okay. All righty. And, and I think it was another question. Did you have any issues with loose skin? I, I do, but not to the point where it's causing me any problems. Granted, if I maybe would have exercise more like tone things like that it would probably not be as bad but i mean i'm to the point where i'm not going to wear a bikini so it's nothing that really bothers me at that point i have you know thought about maybe plastic surgery but it's not right now i'm just focused on feeling good gaining my confidence and i mean it's it's not it's the least of my worries right now just feeling better you know makes makes it worth it to me 
Okay. All right. And then what about energy after surgery? Um, I, I did, you do lack your energy, I feel like, or at least I did. I think it takes a while for that to come back. But then again, you have went through such a big change and you're, you know, just get your protein and fluids in. That's, that's the main thing that's going to help you get back to your energy. And like I said, it took me, for me, it took a good three months for me to really start feeling better. And so, I mean, it's, and I feel like everybody's probably different too. So. I mean, I would think it would be hard to say, you know, for each person as to their energy level is how it affected them. Because I feel like I still keep in contact with two of the ladies that had surgery with me on the same day. And um, I looked around and like, they were all doing good that day after surgery. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, I'm probably like, I believe I would like think I'm probably the youngest one there. And I was like, look at them go. They're walking, they're up, they're feeling good. So, I mean, I think it just affects people differently. Yes. All righty. And it does. It's very individualized. But if you get up and you start walking and the main thing is just staying positive because that's just a little bump in the in the road. Those first couple of weeks and things start to improve. Absolutely. So it's just a bump in the road. Stay positive and things will get better. All right. They want to know if it was it hard maintaining and is it currently hard maintaining a healthy diet two years later? Really, for me, I think my body has kind of, in my mental state, like, I've kind of trained myself. Like, I don't feel like I deprive myself at all. Like, per se, if I do want something that I shouldn't have, if I just get that one bite and say, okay, I'm done, you know, I, I'm done. Because I don't want to deprive myself because I feel like that's going to make it worse. Just, I just get that one little bite and I'm done. Or, you know, I find a good alternative of something, like if I'm wanting something sweet, I may, you know, have, I may not supposed to do this, but I'll get like some peanut butter because I love peanut butter. It, it hasn't affected me yet. You know, you just find alternatives and um, I, I don't feel like it's a struggle for me now because I feel like I've kind of trained my body and I know, okay, I know I can have this. I know I can't have this. Do I want to go back to what I was? Absolutely not. So when you start thinking about that and how far you've come, I don't want to go back there. So that makes me mentally be like, okay, I'm going to make that better choice. All right. And um, they want to know, did you deal with any mental challenges as far as being able to eat certain foods that all of a sudden now you can't? I don't think so. Because I think just the fact of, the weight loss itself, I, I'm just happier. So I don't think it, I, it is kind of hard in the beginning because you're like, I can't eat that or I can't drink that because definitely feel no carbonation. I drink no carbonated drinks whatsoever. Um, but it, it is hard in the beginning. It, not to be able to eat, you know, certain things, but then my body just adjusts to it. And I'm just like, ah, oh, whatever, you know, go on, find something else you like. Like I said, it's, my body, I feel like, has really just adjusted to it, so it doesn't really bother me that much. Okay. And as far as the hospital stay, guys, the hospital stay is two nights. So if you have surgery on a Tuesday, you'll go home on that Thursday. So it's two nights as far as the hospital stay. Okay. Any other questions? And I'd like to say, definitely find somebody, you know, that maybe has had this surgery or that is going to have this surgery that you can talk to, you know, as Vivian or any of the doctors, like if you have questions, because I think talking to people really helps too, because you, for one, you learn like new things to eat, new things to do, how this may work for one person, how this may not work for another person. But talking to people, especially like this, it's, it's, I believe it's a good thing because you learn new stuff and, you know, you can learn things that other people have went through that may can help you as well. So definitely find a support group to stay in or someone that you can still talk to for sure. Exactly. You do need someone to talk to and to be able to bounce ideas off of because they've been through it. So they can probably give you some ideas of different ways to get your protein in, you know, like just say Gen Pro. Some people may mix it with this. I found it was easier to mix it with coffee because it 
the coffee actually takes away the taste of anything, you know, that you have in it. So you can get, get that in. Of course, it's less volume for people who are struggling with trying to do the ready-made shakes. So you're looking at anywhere from, if you do the ready-made, if it's 11 ounces, you're looking at 22 ounces a day. If it's 12 ounces, you're looking at 24 ounces a day. I mean, that's a lot. And I want to say like the muscle milk, some of those are like 14 ounces. So you want to try to do as less volume as possible, but have more protein. You don't want to skip on the protein. You just want to kind of try to minimize the volume that you're drinking. So I would recommend that you have two forms of protein at home. So if you're using Fairlife at home, you still need to have something else available at home that's different. So that way, maybe if after surgery, if one doesn't work, you can use the other. But in order to disguise that taste of Genpro, I think you're probably going to need something that's going to kill that flavor, even though it's supposed to be tasteless. You just from the smell of it, some people kind of get like, uh, uh, I'm not going to be able to do this. But if you mix it in coffee, it takes away that smell. So you don't have to worry about it if you mix it in with the coffee. And you only need at least about maybe two, three ounces of coffee and that's it. And you're done with that 30 gram of protein and you do it again that evening and you're done. You don't have to worry about drinking the large volume that you would have to drink with the ready-made shakes. And, okay, how do you prep for surgery? Well, um, you will, of course, we'll have an education class before surgery, so they'll go over all of that. But to hit the high points on it is you will do a skin prep before surgery at home that night before and that morning before coming to the hospital. And that day before surgery, you will do a bowel prep and you will have medication to take along with that prep that's part of it. But we'll go over all of that with your pre-surgery education day. So you'll have a handout with all of that on there. So you have something to refer back to. Also, um, taking things to the hospital, that will be on there. One of the things, make sure if you have a CPAP machine, you need to um, bring your CPAP device. Of course, with COVID numbers rising, at one point the hospital said that you could not bring your device, that they would use the hospital device. Right now, they haven't informed me of any changes. So right now you're still bringing it to the hospital, but as soon as they let us know something, we'll let you know something. Um, and as far as other stuff to bring, of course, comfortable shoes, even though we give you those no slip socks, do not walk up and down that hallway with those no slip socks on because it makes your calves really sore walking on that concrete. And I did that. that. Yep. <laughs> it makes them sore. Correct. Don't do it because it will make you sore. It does. It makes your legs really sore. So if you wear some comfortable tennis shoes, just something you can flip your feet into and that way you can walk up and down the hall, but walking in those socks really makes your calves sore and you really seem to not feel it until you get home. You know, like that next day, you feel really beat when you get up and start walking, your calves are sore. So mm -hmm. make sure you bring some comfortable shoes, make sure you bring some pajamas that have pockets and you'll be walking out in the hallway. It's a closed off unit, but you still have other people up there. So of course, you know, you wanna bring something that's covering and it has pockets in the pocket is because of the telemetry, you can stick it in your pocket while you're walking. So that way you're not trying to handle all of these cords and wires and all of that and trying to walk too, because it's nice to be able to have something in your hand to drink when you're walking because it goes down better with gravity because you're up and walking. Did that not help you, Allison? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And you can, um, you can. All right, on the clear liquid stage, uh, you can do bone broth, you can do better than bouillon, or you can do the regular broth, but I found that it has more flavor if you make your own broth, like boil a chicken, like you're gonna do chicken and dumpling, you do put all of your seasoning in it and then strain the broth. And you can also put about a teaspoon or a tablespoon of better than bouillon in that and let it cook down and just strain it and use that for your broth. It has more flavor to it because you've add, added your flavors and it's not so bland. And sometimes that's all you need is just a little uptaking the flavoring and you're like, okay, I can get through this another week. <laughs> so sometimes it's hard when you're doing that liquid part of it, you have to be creative. All right. 
any and to me the liquid part it I, you know you think oh my gosh people like that's so hard it to me it was not as hard as i thought it would be it i think it's all mind over matter it's just it's not as bad to me as i thought it was going to be yeah and and that's the thing sometimes you just have to stay positive and if you stay positive it'll it'll move along faster than you think and before you know it it's it's over with and you're getting ready to transition to another diet absolutely stage so and believe me ginger is gonna make sure and i know in the hospital that they may not you know give you like okay we don't expect you to drink 64 ounces while you're in the hospital we just kind of give you a guide because if you did six to eight of those little one ounce cups every hour you will be very close to your 64 ounces before you went to bed that night so but of course you know you need to take it slow don't force it if you feel very uncomfortable then don't force it you just get up and walk around a little bit and then drink some more the ultimate goal is 64 ounces so at least by the time you come for your two-week checkup you should be at least to the 64 ounces then so you just have to take your time and slowly get your self up to that point so don't think that we expect you to have 64 ounces before you leave the hospital, but we want you to constantly be working on that and not just saying, well, okay, they don't expect me to get 64 ounces, so I'm at 20, I'm good. And because you, you know, you're not, because if you go home and you're just doing 20 ounces a day, that's not gonna help you at all. It's gonna, you're gonna be dehydrated basically. So you don't want to do that, but you want to gradually work on it and you don't want to overdo it. If you feel very uncomfortable, then don't keep drinking, get up and walk some and then go back to it. So take breaks and then go back to it. But you want to try to stay focused on how much you're getting in. Ginger, um, she will give you a grid to go by that'll help you and it's by the hour. So if you follow her grid and it's based off of whether you're doing a ready-made shake versus a powder. So you have two different grids depending on what type of protein you're doing. So you use that grid, you will stay on track and you will be able to get your fluids in if you use that grid. And it seems like it's easy now. It is difficult after the surgery. I mean, I struggle too, but it's you have to continue to work on it. If you don't continue to work on it, stay positive, then of course things kind of go downhill, but you don't want that. I feel like you're making a decision to have this surgery and you're gonna try your best to do whatever it is you need to do to make sure that you're doing what you need to do. Yes, yeah, because you'll end up like me a month later and having to go two days in a row for fluids. So definitely get your fluids in. Yep, it's always better for to be able to get it in by mouth and not have to yeah. have IVs. Yes, like I said, I feel like I lived off sugar-free popsicles for the longest. Yep, I ate a lot of I those too. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely keep you some sugar-free popsicles on hand. Exactly, and those way good uh, fudge sickles, I think they have like cookies and cream. It's kind of like a Quest bar, ice cream bar, but they have all these different flavors. And I've been calling trying to see if maybe the GNC here in Tupelo would start getting some, but they're interested in getting them. They just have to try, they're trying to get a rep in that area that would be able to um, come to that store. So, but I think, but that patient that found them, I mean, she loves them. And she said that it is so much easier getting her protein in doing that because 21 grams of protein is low in carbs so it's everything that you would need no different than a protein shake it's just frozen so um in the different flavors so she was like i bought them out i bought all of them that they had so i probably would have to if i'd have found them <laughs> exactly so you know just start looking around now and seeing some different things that you can find that you think that you would like don't buy a book portions of it but you know just buy a little bit to try and have some to try after surgery but because it's things that you could be drinking fair life protein drinks that night before surgery and when you get back home you can't stand them they're awful to you when you taste them so you just have to make sure that you're um 
have something, some other form of protein that you can use while you're at home if you the first one didn't work out for you. Yeah, I'm and, glad you said that, Vivian, because I was going to say, don't go buy stuff in bulk because mm -hmm. you may not be able to handle it after surgery. Yeah, it's, it's too like expensive. Buy, you know, a little to try, but don't don't buy stuff in bulk like that because you're liable to end up wasting a lot of money because it's not going to work for you after surgery. Exactly. It is too expensive. I mean, protein costs a lot of money. All it right. Does. And then yeah. they want to know that you have a lot of problems with being nauseated. I did. I felt like I was nauseated for a long time. If they, I'm like, what, what is it called? You have, um, um, the Zofran? The Zofran, yes. I think I probably took Zofran for almost up to three months and then it just disappeared one day. So, I mean, it, I had it a lot. I never did really throw up, just the nausea, but, um, but it's handled. I take my Zofran and go on. Not that big a deal. All right. Well, and um, they said to thank you, Allison, that a lot of questions that some of them had, you answered the questions for them already just because of some of the things that you were talking about. So, well, I'm glad that she was able to answer those questions. And I just wanted you to see that, I mean, you can be two, three, four years out and still doing good. It's all about, I do feel that logging plays a big part of it keeping up with your intakes because it gives you a better idea of where you stand and you can sit there and you can log something and you're like, that's not even worth my time because it doesn't have enough protein in it. So, and it has too many of this in it. I'm not going to do it. But if you're not logging it, then you don't know. And that's the only way to learn how to track your protein, because if you don't know how to track your protein, then you're just kind of really just up in the air. You're like, okay, I think I got it in. I'm not sure, but I'm, I'll am i just drink this shake just in case I didn't get it in. You don't want to do that. You want to know what you're getting in every day. And if you need to supplement, you may not even need to supplement, but you're a supplement and just because you're unsure. So you want to be sure. So do like Allison and start logging. Um, Cause it's the baritistic app that you use, right? Allison. It is. It is. Um, I think so you can download the Baryotistic app and it helps you to track your fluids, your protein, your carbs. That's what it kind of looks like. Yep. For people. And the, it also it's a little notepad in there where you can journal all of it. So you can keep up with things like that after the surgery. And once you start doing that about a year out, you could basically look at the menu at, at a restaurant and pretty much tell how much protein it's going to be when you order this or order that. But you want to be able to get to that point and you don't want to be a year out and not knowing how to track your protein and knowing how much protein is in certain things. Absolutely. I log everything I put in my mouth every day and have since surgery. Uh, I split and I know. And, you know, I know a lot of people that don't and they haven't maybe haven't had as much success, but uh, that is one thing for sure. We do liquids and protein log everything and get your exercise. Yes, exactly. Make sure you're exercising. But I can say with patients, they come back there four years, six years, 10 years. Those who log, they're pretty consistent with staying steady with their weight and not gaining. So you want to try to make sure to just consider some of the things that Allison has spoke about tonight. Well, all right. Well, Miss Allison, I appreciate it so much for you taking out your time to do this for us. And you're welcome. Congratulations on your weight loss and maintaining your weight loss. And of course, you know, we're here and we're not a clinic um, who just follow you up just for a year. It's a lifetime follow up. So absolutely you for a lifetime. Definitely, and keep your appointments that way. You know, if you still have questions to ask, because I still have questions to ask two years out. I mean, definitely keep your appointments because I, I mean, everybody's wonderful there. And if you follow their plan, you and do everything you know that we've discussed, you you should do great. And you know, good luck to all of y'all. And if y'all have questions, find somebody to ask. Definitely, just don't don't hesitate and don't be scared. Just just do it. <laughs> Well, all right. Well, Ms. Ellison, thank you again. And you have thank a good you. evening. Good night, everyone. You too. Bye-bye, everyone.